Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we studied the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series for the months of uh, April, May, and June of 2017 is entitled Feed My Sheep. And it's a study of First and Second Peter in the New Testament. This is lesson number six in that series for May 6 of 2017 entitled Suffering for Christ. Now if you know about 1 Peter, there's quite a lot of talk about suffering. In fact, in our a lesson last week we talked about suffering somewhat, but this particular lesson is going to really focus on the question of suffering for Christ. What would that mean to Christians in the 21st century? Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we don't live in situations where suffering seems to be an ordinary part of our lives, at least some of us. Maybe in some places in the world it's a serious problem, but for us it's a pretty comfortable life. So is that because we're not really representing you adequately? Paul says that if we really want to live lives like Christ Jesus, we're going to suffer persecution, but it, it doesn't seem to be true in our day. Is there something that we're missing? Help us as we read this lesson today that we may, and study it together, that we may understand exactly what you had in mind for us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't think there's any question about the fact that the Christian church started out with suffering. I mean, look, look at the life of Jesus as, as the foundation stone all kinds of troubles and trials and persecution. Um, and I guess what we need to say is the devil is alive and well on planet Earth. He's Aren't alive, you? but he's not well. Okay, well, that, he's not well mentally. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, that's true. Well, look at, for example, 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. Be glad about this, even though it may not be, it may be, it may now be necessary for you to be sad for a while because of the many kinds of trials you suffer. Their purpose is to prove your faith is genuine. Even gold, which can be destroyed, is tested by fire, and so your faith, which is much more precious than gold, must also be tested, so that it may endure. Then you will receive praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed. So do we need to suffer in order for our faith to be tested? Well, it's interesting that if you go over to the end of 1 Peter, all the way to chapter 5, you can get there very quickly. In verse 10, it says this, But after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who calls you to share his eternal glory and union with Christ, will himself perfect you and give you firmness, strength, and a sure foundation. To him be the power forever. Amen. So it seems like Peter starts his book with persecution and he ends it with persecution, at least the first book. What would it mean to be tested by fire? Yeah, Presumably uh, that's a metaphor. <laughs> let's hope so. <laughs> what kind of metaphor would it be? Purification. Okay. But how do we get purified? Mm -hmm. Blessed are the pure in mm -hmm. spirit or in heart. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, well, for those of you who maybe are watching on television and can halt your TV and want to look at some passages, there's three main passages in 1 Peter that talk about suffering. 1 Peter 2, verses 18 to 25, 1 Peter 3, verses 13 to 21, and 1 Peter 4, verses 12 to 19. And those are fairly lengthy passages, so I'm not going to read them all right now, but we do not know exactly where Peter was and what he was doing when this letter was written. It's even possible that Peter himself was in prison. We're almost certain that at the end of his life, he was imprisoned in what, what is now known as the Mamertine prison. It was a hole in the rock, literally, I don't know how much, it, maybe there was a hole there naturally, but basically it's carved out now, 
and they would let these people down through a hole in the in the ceiling and there's no way to get back up through there because it's too high for you to reach it and then there's just a gutter out for waste and so forth out the bottom and there you are there's no place to go now today there's a there's a stairway down one side that uh, you can walk down there and I, I've been in there a couple of times um, but originally there was no stairway that's for sure um, kind but, of a manual cover yeah exactly lets people in well don't we live in countries where there's freedom of religion and freedom of speech why would it be necessary for Christians to suffer persecution couldn't God protect us God could surely if he wa if he wanted to well there's an interesting verse look at this verse uh, first Revelation 14 and I'm going to start with actually verse 3 the 144,000 people stood before the throne the four living creatures and the elders they were singing a new song which only they could learn they are the only ones who have been redeemed they are the men who have kept themselves pure by not having sexual relations with women this is symbolic of being pure Christians they are virgins they follow the lamb wherever he goes they have been redeemed from the rest of the human race and are the first ones to be offered to God and to the Lamb. So where did the Lamb go? To the cross. To the cross. Is that where the best Christians are going to go? Take your cross and follow me, he said. Mm -hmm. that, that implied that there's going to be suffering along the way? Mm -hmm. I... I really puzzle over that statement by Jesus because he said that very early in his ministry. Mm -hmm. And the disciples could not not possibly have had any idea what in the world he was talking about at that point. Cross, huh? I mean, they knew about people being crucified as, as traitors, but Jesus is going to be the king of the Jews. He, there, there couldn't be any relationship between this Jesus and being crucified. I mean, they... They must, have been they must have really been puzzled. But before he said that, blessed are you and you will be persecuted for my name's sake, which means that he could anticipate the day when there would be persecutions. And we're not talking only about persecutions by being hung or by being uh, put on a cross. Mm -hmm. But I think that a true Christian, a person who truly loves the world, even his enemies, that love is considered weak by, the, by most people. Mm -hmm. And in itself, that is a form of persecution. They put you away, put you aside. You have to stand up for your rights. Exactly. Which people is, are marching in the streets. <laughs> stand your ground. Yeah. Well, Peter makes three very interesting statements about this. First Peter 1, verse 7, we read just a moment ago, their purpose is to, the, the reason for the persecution, their purpose is to prove that your faith is genuine. That's the first point. His second point in 1 Peter 5 verse 10, God will himself perfect you and give you firmness, strength, and a sure foundation. John, remember in, in, in Revelation 14, says we need to endure. And that's, that's talking about surviving not so pleasant situations. 1 Peter 4 verses 13 and 14 says, Rather be glad that you are sharing Christ's suffering so that you may be full of joy when his glory is revealed. Happy are you if you are insulted because you are Christ's followers. This means that the glorious spirit, the spirit of God is resting on you. And I chose to add one from James chapter 1 verse 34. You know what? You know that when your faith succeeds in facing such trials, the result is the ability to endure. So, how does that improve our faith? Are those well, things? It strengthens our resolve, which is part of faith. Uh, it, uh, any, with any, uh, whether it's mental exercise or or physical exercise, there's uh, there's a pushing forward. Uh, there's an attempt to. To do more and in physical exercise technically all exercise is catabolic it tears down and then when you rest uh, your body responds to that and builds it up and if you keep that in balance you get stronger and stronger yeah. 
So there could be a parallel there in terms of thinking and spiritual uh, dependence and faith in God as we we grow in that. If we okay. if we're not, you know, it's I, I'm, I, in um, in uh, Ellen White talks about how if uh, uh, Adam and Eve had uh, survived the test, in other words, if they had mm -hmm. chosen made good ch choices, then the tree of knowledge uh, of evil would have been taken away. So there is a, a necessity for us to to exercise in order to grow and to become more than uh, as God tries to build us up. An example of what might have been might have been going on in, in Peter's day. Now this is this was written about forty years later, so it wasn't exactly in Peter's time. Pliny the Younger ruled in Bithynia. Bithynia is in northwestern. Uh, Turkey, modern Turkey. And uh, so he ruled Bithynia for at least one year, AD 103, and then was elected to be an augur. What's an augur? A person who studied the flights and behavior of birds to somehow predict the direction of the government in Rome. Then in 104, AD 104 through 110, he was a member of Trajan's Judicial, Judicial Council, so like a member of the Supreme Court. In A.D. 110 to 113, long after Peter was dead, he was chosen again to rule in Bithynia and Pontus. Both of those places are in northwestern Turkey. Here's what he wrote to the emperor at the time. How to deal with Christians. The method I have observed towards these who, call, who have been denounced to me as Christians is this. So if you're accused of being a Christian, he calls you before him, and this is what he says. I have interrogated them whether they were Christians. If they confessed it, I repeated the question twice again, adding the threat of capital punishment. If they still persevered, I ordered them to be executed. If you say three times that yes, you're a Christian, off with your head. For whatever the nature of their creed might be, I could at least feel no doubt that contumacy and inflexible obstinacy deserve chastisement. Those who denied they were Christians or had ever been Christians, who repeated after me an invocation to the gods and offered an adoration with wine and frankincense to your image, he's talking to the emperor now, which I had ordered to be brought for that purpose, together with those of the gods, remember he's talking about the Roman gods, the pagan gods, and who finally cursed Christ, none of which acts it is said those who are really Christians can be forced into performing, these I thought it proper to discharge. Others who were named by that informer at first confessed themselves Christians and then denied it. Two, they had been of that persuasion, but they had quitted it some three years, others many years, and a few as much as 25 years ago. They all worshipped your statue and the images of the gods and cursed Christ. So that's how you preserved your life if you were ruled by Pliny the Younger. We must, do, we, we must admit that the best evidence we have that was that worship, worshiping a living emperor in Peter's day was pretty unusual. Although in that section of Asia Minor, now modern Turkey, it sometimes did happen. I've been there and seen some of those temples. There were times in the first century that Christians faced serious danger just for being Christians. That was particularly to after Emperor Nero, uh, under emperors Nero and and that was AD 54 to 60, and Domitian, AD 81 to 96. Actually, that's an error. It should be Nero lived quite a while after 60. Anyway, sorry. Um, so what about in this short letter, Peter seems to be focusing more on local troubles, including false accusations, revilings, and reproach. These trials may have been very hard on new Christians, but they probably did not result in widespread imprisonment or death. So what way do you think local Christians could be reviled, persecuted, troubled? Could that happen to us today? Sure. Yes. Well, they uh, could be persecuted by Jews, mm -hmm. as Paul and Timothy and the others were. Yeah. Well, Ellen White puts it in these words, Desire of Ages, page 669, going over on to page 670. 
at all times and in all places, in all sorrows and in all afflictions, when the outlook seems dark and the future perplexing, and we feel helpless and alone, the Comforter will be sent in answer to the prayer of faith. Circumstances may separate us from every earthly friend, but no circumstance, no distance can separate us from the Heavenly Comforter. Whenever, wherever we are, wherever we may go, He is always at our right hand to support, sustain, uphold, and cheer. But when He leaves the sanctuary, now this is another passage, when he leaves the sanctuary in heaven at the end of the earth's, this earth's history, darkness covers the inhabitants of the earth. In that fearful, fearful time, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. The restraint which has been upon the wicked is removed, and Satan has entire control of the, of the finally impenitent. God's long, long suffering has ended. The world has rejected his mercy, despised his love, and trampled upon his law. The wicked have passed the boundary of their probation. The Spirit of God, persistently resisted, has been at last withdrawn, unsheltered by divine grace. They have no protection from the wicked one. Satan will then plunge, plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one great final trouble. As the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. The whole world will be involved in ruin more terrible than any, I'm sorry, more terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem of old. You, you remember that in Jerusalem, if you tried to escape from Jerusalem when it was being besieged, they would catch you, they would crucify you right out there just in full view of anybody who was looking over the wall. And, and some sources say that those, the crosses were so, and they wouldn't take you down, they'll just let you rot there. The crosses were so tied together it was hard to walk between them. Just Well, going on, reading, continuing to read from Great Controversy, page 614. A single angel destroyed all the firstborn of the Egyptians and filled the land with mourning. When David offended against God by numbering the people, one angel caused that terrible destruction by which sin was punished. The same destructive power exercised by holy angels when God commands will be exercised by evil angels when he permits. There are forces now ready and only waiting the divine permission to spread desolation everywhere. And I might remind you that was written in 1888. Now ready. Wow. Well, look at, I'm going to take a moment here to read 1 Peter 3, 13 to 22. Who will harm if you will who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, how happy you are. Of course, that's what, Peter, and that's what Jesus suggested. Do not be afraid of anyone, do not worry, but have reverence for Christ in your hearts and honor him as Lord. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope you have in him, in you. Do we, are we ready to do, the, to do that? But do it with gentleness and respect. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are insulted, those who speak evil of your, your good conduct as followers of Christ will be ashamed of what they say. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once and for all, a good man on behalf of sinners, and, and so forth. I'm going to conclude it right there. Um, Peter seems to suggest that Persecution should be expected if we're Christians. Is that still true? As long as we're in the world, so. you're, uh, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Mm -hmm. Those who remember Emilio Connectly, mm -hmm. uh, he I remember one time he spoke, well, if you're not suffering some level, you must not be doing God's will. <laughs> the, Satan's not, not uh, Attack you about what we got to First Peter five eight, the devil goes around like a roaring lion, yeah. seeking who he may devour. Yeah. So, uh, well, First Peter three fifteen suggests that when persecution comes, we should keep our eyes focused on the promises we have in Jesus. That will help to allay our fears. Well, we were encouraged in these lessons to read something about the final events of this earth's history. So I, let me include a couple more here. 
What is it that we will face in the future that might cause fear? The time of trouble such as never was is soon to open upon us, and we shall need an experience which we do not now possess, and which many are too indolent to obtain. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality. But this is not true of the crisis before us. The most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal. In that time of trouble, every soul must stand for himself before God. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in the land, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall not deliver, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Great Controversy, page 622 to, 6, to 625. As the decree issued by the various rulers of Christendom against commandment keepers shall withdraw the protection of government and abandon them to those who desire their destruction, the people of God will flee from the cities and villages and associate together in companies dwelling in the most desolate and solitary places. Many will find refuge in the strongholds of the mountains. Like the Christians of the Piedmont Valleys, they will make the high places of the earth their sanctuaries and will thank God for the munitions of rocks, Isaiah 33, 16. But many of all nations and of all classes, high and low, rich and poor, black and white, will be cast into the most unjust and cruel bondage. The beloved of God pass weary days, bound in chains, shut up by prison bars, sentenced to be slain, some apparently left to die of starvation in dark and loathsome dungeons. No human ear is open to the, hear their moans. No human hand is ready to lend them help. Desi uh, Great Controversy, page 626. When Christ ceases his intercession, the sanctuary, the unmingled wrath threatened against those who worship the beast in his image and receive his mark, as mentioned in Revelation 14, 9 and 10, will be poured out. The plagues upon Egypt, when God was about to deliver Israel, were similar in character to those more terrible and extensive judgments which are to fall upon the world just before the final deliverance of God's people. Great Controversy 627, paragraph 3. So, what does that tell you? What do we know about those Egyptian plagues? Well, they didn't uh, fall on Israel, totally. I think they yeah. uh, did the first three affect them. First three affected them to a certain degree, yes. But the other ones. The blood turned to water. I mean, the water turned to blood. Yeah. yeah. And then um, even in the fountains and so forth. And then it goes on uh, the, the the heat and so forth. And right on through up to, of course, the last one was their uh, slaying of the firstborn. So those are pretty serious things. I mean, killing all the cattle, killing a lot of the people, killing, you know, I don't know whether we could have another plague of frogs or a plague of flies, but I can tell you, if you've ever been bitten one of those flies in, Ad, in, in Africa where I used to live, whew, you certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to be bitten by a whole bunch of them. They were terrible. Further uh, up in the chapter on 621, Point two, mm -hmm. she says the season of distress and anguish will be c before us will require a faith that will endure weariness, delay, and hunger, a faith that will not faint though severely tried. So those three areas, mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's kind of a uh, universal. I mean, if a child is crying, what do you think is wrong? Mm -hmm. Well, they're hungry, they're uh, tired or their uh, in need of immediate attention. So mm -hmm. those, those are tied up in the same uh, package there, weariness, delay, and hunger. hunger. Yeah. So those are the things that our faith needs to be able to rise above. It's hard to believe that at a time when we complain so much about torture and water, uh, waterboarding and so on, that this could come back with such violence. Yeah. Yeah. Terrible things are coming. Just absolutely awful things. Look at First Peter 3, verse 16 again. But do it, 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 you're exhibiting your hope, but do it with gentleness and respect, 
Keep your conscience clear so that when you are insulted, those who speak evil of your good conduct as followers of Christ will be ashamed of what they say. Was that true of Jesus? Oh, yes. Do you think it'll be true of the people at the end? The Christians, the faithful followers of God? Just as it was true of Stephen later on, it will be true of those who live in the last days because they will have the mind of Christ. Clearly, the, the, the purity and love of Jesus was a constant rebuke to those who hated him. And that, I mean, if we're supposed to be like Jesus, that should be the same for us, shouldn't it? But Jesus did what he needed to do. He followed the plan that was set out for him. He, ag he agreed to everything the Father. I'm sure those long, sometimes all-night sessions of prayer were planning sessions between him and the Father. He, he died for our sins. And by his life and his death, he answered the most important questions in the great controversy, disproving all of Satan's accusations against God. Well, I don't know if... Have any of you ever suffered for doing what was right? Yes. Okay. I was 11 years old mm -hmm. in a French system mm -hmm. of education. They had school on Sabbath. Mm -hmm. I had Latin class on Sabbath, and every Sabbath the Latin teacher made sure that he called my name so he could give me a big fat zero, mm -hmm. which means that every Sunday I had to go on detention all day long because I got a zero on Saturday. Yeah. Yeah, well, my experience is a little different than that. I, uh, in academy, in a boarding academy, um, and I won't go into all the details, but I was leading out in a Bible study. And we had permission to meet in the administration building to do that. But one of the teachers got upset because um, of something that one of the people in our Bible study group did and said, we're stopping this Bible study and maybe it's causing the problem. Well, unfortunately, um, the, the, the night watchman was supposed to open the door for us so that we could go into the administration building and, and have our Bible study um, there in the peace and quiet because I had keys to the inside part of the, because I was a senior and I had keys to the, the science lab. And so w the night that the, we didn't know, the, the night that the, that the uh, night watchman didn't open the door for us, I'd been around long enough, I knew how to get into the ad building. So we got into the ad building, we had our Bible study, and I was promptly put on three days of labor because I was conducting a Bible study. Of course, they would have said it wasn't for conducting the Bible study, it was for breaking into the administration building, but anyway. Those are minor things compared to, well, yours was much more serious than what happened to me. Um, well, we know that several other members. Just look at a couple of other places. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. We've, we've mentioned this before. Paul says, everyone, could this be true? Everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Are you all trying to live godly lives in union with Christ Jesus? Would it be fair to say that if you're not being persecuted, you're not trying hard enough? I don't think that's what Paul had in mind. Well, it's kind of like getting you ready for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you'll never say, oh, I'm being persecuted. I don't like to do this anymore. He's just telling you ahead of time, count the costs, mm -hmm. because you you could be persecuted. Okay. Jesus himself said, John fifteen eighteen, if the world hates you, just remember that it has hated me first. If you belong to the world, the world will love you. So Christians are not supposed to belong to the world. Well, we know why Jesus suffered. It was part of the divine plan to solve the, answer the questions in the great controversy and so forth. But why do we need to suffer? We're not, are we answering any questions in the great controversy? What do you think? We need to demonstrate we have the faith of Jesus. Okay. And therefore, we will be persecuted because we have that faith, which is incongruent with the faith of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. 
And this will cause us to, to suffer in, the, in a variety of ways. And not all of it will be physical. Some of it went mental and uh, yeah. accusations of all sorts. Yeah. Well, let's think in terms of the great controversy for a moment. What would Satan like to do here on planet Earth? If he, if he just had, had absolute complete control, what, would he do, what do you think he would want to do? Get rid of the likes of us. Yeah. Right. Just completely get rid of anybody who's following God. And then he would like to turn to God and say, well, God, you, if, or, or just take your people. Get them out of here and leave this world to me. Me and my people, Satan talking, me and my people will just live here on planet Earth and you can have the whole rest of the universe. And what is God's response to that? Response to that? I'm not only not going to let you take over this earth, I'm going to make this earth my future headquarters. And you can just see Satan saying, oh, <laughs> no. But that's exactly what God's going to do, isn't it? Oh, what, what, what point are you trying to say by, by imagining that? Well, so we would suggest that Satan's number one thing, if he, if he, if he had a free hand, would be to harass and destroy Christians. That would be his Peter goal. Peter five eight says that. Yeah, you know, it is, uh, goes around like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. Okay, now since we know that's not going to be, he's not going to be allowed to do that. That God is going to have a people at the end of time. What does God want to say to His faithful people? I, some of you remember the teachings and the and the, and the thoughts of. of Dr. Richard Neese. He was a, a great thinker and theologian. And he used to say, Satan has always said, from, from the days of Adam and Eve to the present time, he's always taunted God. Okay, God, you might have one person here and one person there, but I've got a whole world that are following me. Where are your people, God? And he tries to mock God by doing that kind of stuff. And he suggested, and I, I think this, there's certain some truth to this, that God is finally going to say, just wait, just wait. I know you've waited a long time, but at the end of this world's history, at their very worst time for human beings in, in, in possible, God is going to have a, at least a small group of people who are going to stand up faithful to him, saying even to Satan's face, say to him, no matter what you do, I will not follow you. I, I, I deny that you're telling the truth. What you says is in contradiction to what the scripture says, and I will not bow. And that will, that will be, and God will say, there are my jobs. There's a whole bunch of them. Here are they which keep the commandments exactly. of God in the faith of Jesus. We have an opportunity to also declare that he is worthy to yeah. receive honor and glory and blessing and power and well, might. And, and Jesus himself had said, Matthew 24, 9 and 10, Then you will be arrested and handed over to be punished and be put to death. All nations will hate you because of me. Many will give up their faith at that time. They will betray one another and hate one another. Ellen White said, So it will be with all who live godly in Christ Jesus. Persecution and reproach await all who are imbued with the Spirit of Christ. The character of the persecution changes with the times, but the principle, the spirit that underlies it, is the same that has slain the chosen of the Lord ever since the days of Abel. That's Acts of the Apostles 576 and some other places. Well, we know what Revelation says. There's a lot of talk about how the righteous will suffer in Revelation. Revelation 12, 17 especially, the dragon was furious with the woman. Who was the dragon? Satan. Devil. Yeah, it just says so right there in Revelation 13, doesn't it? In Revelation 12 also. The dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants, all those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. Now, don't Seventh-day Adventists claim that as part of our heritage? That verse, we do, don't we? I think the translation should say, because they have the faith of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I think it's the faith of Jesus that gives us the strength to 
s to endure those persecutions. It's not the other way around. The persecutions don't strengthen our faith as much as the other way around. Revelation 14, 12, another verse we claim from the book of Revelation. This calls for, and this is at the end of the three angels' messages, and, and all of us as Seventh-day Adventists are supposed to be able to give a clear explanation of the three angels' messages. Have you tried it recently? Mm -hmm. Anyway, this is the end. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Now, there's different ways to translate mm -hmm. that, of course. but Well, in the early days of Christianity, it was said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Why would that be? It shows that they were serious and other, you know, that they were willing to die, that uh -huh. was, uh, they must have believed that this was true, and so it could strengthen the, the faith of others who were like-minded. Okay. <coughs> Any other? That's that's a great start. Can you think of any other reasons why the blood of the martyrs would be the seed of the church? Anybody else? I think people will recognize that you could not go through such an ordeal with a smile and love in your heart if it wasn't there, mm -hmm. and therefore they'll recognize that it's that love that gives you the strength to endure that. And people people don't die for something they don't really care about. So, I mean, you know, think of the people who have testified to Jesus as they're burning, as they're being crucified, and so forth. Amazing. Well, people have died for a girlfriend. They have died for their country. Why can't we accept to die because we hold firm to love, yeah. the kind of love that Jesus came to bring us? Yeah. Well, you look at the blood of the martyrs as a seed you're you're almost imagining the blood sprouting into something bigger into the church mm -hmm. getting bigger so it's like growing it's yeah. it starts as a seed which is the blood and it grows because of that because of what i don't know what if, it, well, it grows what, yeah um i mean there's no question about the fact that the, the Christian church grew just exponentially in those first couple hundred years. And there were, there were times, at least during those, that, those periods, that year period, that there was a lot of persecution. Yeah, Why? You know, it kind of changed, though, didn't it? I think I've yeah. heard some ideas that Satan said, this isn't working. We're going to have to do it a different way. Yep. Which if is, that's true, yeah, if that's true, then why is he going to go back to it later on? Whatever he thinks is working at the time. Yeah. Well, think, think, thinking about that, Peter suggested that the trial would come, uh, the trial that would come against Christians would be a fiery trial. Why would he call it a fiery trial? Maybe the idea that it, the fire, w you know, if you if you think of our faith as gold, then the fire melts away the dross. In other words, there's a, a cleansing element to the whole process. So fire is a is a good example, isn't it? It purifies and and so forth the the, the precious metals, doesn't it? Both silver and gold can be purified that way. It almost uh, fire also means anger, also. So yeah. they're surrounded with anger from someone else, of course. But. So um, can we, what can we do to prepare ourselves for that time which we know is coming soon? And Ellen White, again, Great Controversy, page 593 and going on to 594, makes it very clear. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. I don't know how it could be put any clearer than that. We'll look at a couple more passages. 1 Peter 4, 17 to 19. The time has come for judgment to begin, and God's own people are the first to be judged. If it starts with us, how will it end with those who do not believe the good news from God? As the scripture says, it is difficult for good people to be saved. What then will become 
of godless sinners. So then those who suffer because it is God's will for them, sorry, should, be, should by their good actions trust themselves completely to their Creator who always keeps His promises. Now where did those ideas come from? Well, look at some other places. Isaiah 10, 10 to 12. I stretched out my hand, this is God speaking, to punish those kingdoms that worship idols, idols more numerous than those of Jerusalem and Samaria. I have destroyed Samaria and all its idols, and I will do the same to Jerusalem and the images that are worshipped there. But the Lord says, when I finish what I'm doing on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, I will punish the emperor of Assyria for all his boasting and all his pride. So is God the one who's pouring out these, uh, these, these terrible things? He allows it. It's not okay. that he does it. Well, we think about the story of Job. Who did the persecuting in the story of Job? Satan. It's pretty clear that if Satan was given a clear hand, a free hand, we know what he would do, right? Well, you asked earlier what he would do. I think that he wouldn't just kill the firstborn as it was the case in Egypt. He'd just kill everybody. Well, he did that with <laughs> Why waste time? <laughs> what? He killed his uh, family members, mm -hmm. uh, Job's family members. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All except his wife. Well, Jesus gives a little bit of a puzzling parable in Luke 18. Look at that for a moment, the first eight verses. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to teach them that they should always pray and never become discouraged. In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected people. And there was a widow in that same town who kept coming to him and pleading for her rights, saying, help me against my opponent. Now we don't know exactly what the issue was here, but clearly the Bible suggests that she was in the right. For a long time the judge refused to act, but at last he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because of all the trouble this widow is giving me, I will see to it that she gets her rights. If I don't, she will keep on coming and finally wear me out. And the Lord continued, listen to what the corrupt judge said. Now will God not judge in favor of his own people who cry to him day and night for help? Will he be slow to help them? I tell you, he will judge in their favor and do it quickly. But will the Son of Man find faith on earth when he comes? So, that sounds like everything is backwards. Does God need to be begged and pleaded with? Well, he's setting up uh, in a, sort of a hyperbole here that this person is so bad and, mm -hmm. and he can be brought uh, to uh, bring about what he needs to do. Uh, how much more quickly will God respond? Mm -hmm. Because he's not going to be like this, this unrighteous judge. He's going to be just the opposite. He's going to respond quickly. Don't you also think that maybe, doesn't it feel like that when it's on some of your prayers, that you pray to God and there's no answer and there's no mm -hmm. answer, and you just keep praying and you keep praying? Uh, I'm seeing here that Jesus is saying, just keep doing it. You know, the, God doesn't get wore out, but he will answer. Okay. Well, let's, let's try to really see if we can give a, a fairly succinct comment or answer to the question of why Christians need to suffer. Surely that was the answer, that was the question that Job had. Remember Job 1.8. Do you, did you notice, this is God speaking to the devil. Did you notice my servant Job? The Lord asked, there is no one on earth as faithful and good as he is. He worships me and is careful not to do anything evil. So at the beginning of that whole Job thing, God declared him to be a, a perfect and upright man. So is it true then that like, and you can read, compare 1 Peter 5, 8, Revelation 12, 9, and Revelation 2, 10. Let me, let me just read one of those passages. Why do we suffer? Well, then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil, there he is identified, or Satan, 
had deceived the whole world, and he was thrown down to the earth and all his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now God's salvation has come. Now God has shown his power as king. Now his Messiah has shown his authority. For the one who stood before our God and accused our brothers and sisters day and night has been thrown out of heaven. Our brothers and sisters won the victory by the truth, uh, victory over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the truth which they proclaimed. And they will, were willing to give up their lives and die. And so be glad, you heavens, and all you that live there, how, but how terrible for the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you and he's filled with rage because he knows that he has only a little time left. What do we call someone who believes that it's only a short time until Jesus comes again? The Adventist. Adventist? Is the devil an Adventist? Sure. Well, in that sense, he is, isn't he? <laughs> Well, so the short answer is that we need to suffer because the Satan is alive and well. He's, well, not well. Because is... we're a target to him. Yeah. We're, we're trying to, as Job he, did, uh, serve God and do what is right. The longer he can delay any, any final events, the longer he can stay alive. And it's just as simple as that. Hebrews, what is it, Hebrews 2, it says, those who through fear of death are in lifelong bondage. Yeah. Satan's had a long life, and he's got a type of bondage that was self-imposed on himself. He, and then you got the, what, Ephesians six twelve. we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers in the heavenly places. So. Yep. But there's another reason. I think that uh, mercy is a virtue we will not need in heaven because nobody will attack us. Mm -hmm. To demonstrate that we have love capable of mercy, which is the nth degree of love, persecution will demonstrate to the world that there are some people who really believe in this love, yeah. and many will join them because they recognize the beauty of that mindset, mm -hmm. which is that of Christ. Mm -hmm. God cannot convince through force. He does not. You know, well, he, he really can't because yeah. if God is love, he can't use force. Yeah, that's okay? true. We, we got to get, it's a, like a mathematical equation. God is love, never changes. Now you can go from there and build your model that makes some sense. Okay, so let's, let's talk, just really nail down here on the great controversy. Where does the great controversy take place? In our mind. Between our ears, right? This is not a mere metaphor of some kind, a symbol for good and evil in our natures. There is a real devil and a real Jesus fighting a real battle for human beings. And that controversy takes place between our ears. It is controversy over the beliefs and minds of human beings. Christians need to recognize that we may not be able to give an answer for why we are suffering at any given moment. Remember Job. Was, did Job know exactly why he was suffering? No. We may suffer and we may not know why, why did that happen to me right now. But we know the overall picture that, that God, and, and we know that the out, what the outcome is going to be, don't we? Who's already won the great controversy? Jesus, right? Well, does suffering help us to understand the life, ministry, and death of Jesus better? I think so, and Jesus suffered at the hands of his creatures, mm -hmm. and God suffers when when uh, he hears theologians and preachers misrepresent him. When he, when he was the suffering he d did here years ago or two thousand years ago with the Pharisees and the mm -hmm. religious leaders, the pious frauds of the day. So, how, how does suffering? Do you th how do you think suffering helps us to understand the character of Jesus and of God? We need to recognize this is a transitory situation. It's not forever. Life on this earth is short. Mm -hmm. It is worth revealing the character of Christ to vindicate God mm -hmm. and show him that Satan was in fact wrong mm -hmm. because Satan was against the principles, uh, the principle of love that God had established. Mm -hmm. And here we are in the process of understanding why we should recognize that love, live it, all the way to the level of mercy, which means against all that could come against mm -hmm. us. 
If we learn to endure suffering, does that make us more committed to the truth? I think it's the truth that commits us to remain faithful to that love for our enemies, which is mercy. Yeah, the, the people who are absolutely committed to the truth, they will not tolerate the errors that the Satan will come and try to perpetrate. Here's again from, El, from Ellen White, Great Controversy. Those who honor the law of God have been accused of bringing judgments upon the world, and they will be regarded as the cause of the fearful convulsions of nature and the strife and bloodshed among men that are filling the earth with woe. You know this, this, this story that uh, the world will be looking for a scapegoat, and they say, oh, here are these people who are being faithful to God, keeping the commandments, etc. They must be the problem. The power attending the last warning has enraged the wicked. Their anger is kindled against all who have received the message, and Satan will, ex it will excite to still greater intensity the spirit of hatred and persecution. Great Controversy 614 and 615. Well, we have hinted at the idea that Peter was not the only one in the New Testament who foretold sufferings, trials, and persecutions. Jesus did in Matthew 5. He did again in Matthew 24. We've looked at those passages. We looked at John 15, verse 20. Remember what I told you, slaves are not greater than their master. If people persecuted me, they will persecute you too. If they obeyed me, my teaching, they will obey yours too. Uh, 2 Corinthians we've looked at. 2 Timothy we've looked at. James 1 we've looked at. And 1 Peter 4.19, Peter suggested that we need to trust our selves completely to our Creator. What does that have to do with our suffering? Well, let's look at the verse real quick. So then, those who suffer because it is God's will for them should by their good actions trust themselves completely to their Creator who always keeps His promise. The point is that even if we die, it doesn't really matter because as long as we die loving, we know where we're going to be. And, you know, I just, I think about the incredible changes that took place among the disciples after, from between crucifixion weekend and, and Pentecostal weekend. I mean, they realized, you know, even if we die, it doesn't matter. Because Jesus di died in, in worst kind of death, and three days later he went to heaven. So we do not have to be afraid of anything. And he's, Peter stood up there in front of the Sanhedrin and said, You, this Jesus who raised this man from the dead, from, you know, healed this man here, is the same Jesus that you crucified. I mean, they were, you know, they must have just been in a state of shock. Wow. You got Hebrews well, what, 14, 15, he says, that they might destroy him who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Mm-hmm. Well, the great controversy has been won. Do trials and troubles help us to grow and grow our characters? And there's, you've already looked at some of the passages there in Hebrews, 1 Peter, several places. In light of what we've studied so far, what does suffering actually do for us? In some way, might it help us to understand Jesus better? I think so. There's an interesting break between 1 Peter 4, 11 and the next verse. Look, look at that. Whoever preaches must preach God's messages. Whoever serves must serve with the strength that God gives so that in all things praise may be given to God through Jesus Christ, to whom belong glory and power forever and ever. Amen. It almost sounds like he's, he's ending his book there, doesn't it? Well, look at the next verse. My dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful test you are suffering as though something unusual were happening to you. Did he stop working on his book for a while and then restart? What do you think happened there? We know that this book was written about the time when Nero tried to burn down the city of Rome and then accused the Christians of being responsible. Is it possible that the fiery trials mentioned in 1 Peter 4.12 are reference to that event? Possibly. Remember, Everybody in Rome basically knew that Emperor, that Nero was the one who was responsible for that fire. But he had to try to deflect the, the blame again, away from himself, and so he, he accused Christians. And Christians, of course, many were probably arrested and killed. Others fled. Do you know the names of some Christians who fled at that time? A little bit of trivia. 
Mm. Aquila and Priscilla, Aquila. the tent makers, mm. fled from Rome. And they, ended, they went to Corinth, and there's where they met Paul, and they were, you know, Paul lived with them. So, um, Peter said we need to be warned about persecutions that are coming. He said we're, we are to suffer for doing, if we suffer for doing what is right, we are participating in the sufferings of Christ. That means that one day we will share in his glory and our joy will be even greater. It's interesting to notice that the name Christian wasn't originally proud, a name to be proud of. Um, the general population in those days when Peter and, G and Paul lived it was originally a, an attra attached to Christians in Antioch as if to say, these are those crazy people who look to a dead man to save them. Think about that. Well, we know in the last couple of minutes we have that way back in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 8, the prophet described some terrible things that the children of Israel were doing and going through in his day. He then went on to Ezekiel 9, and this is what those verses say. Then I heard God sh shout, Come here, you men who are going to punish the city. Bring your weapons with you at once. Six men came from the outer north gate of the temple, each one carrying a weapon. With them was a man dressed in linen clothes, carrying something to write with. They all came and stood by the bronze altar. Then the dazzling light of the presence of the God of Israel rose up from the winged creatures where it had been and moved to the entrance to the temple. The Lord called to the man dressed in linen, go through the whole city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the forehead of everyone who is distressed and troubled because of all the disgusting things being done in the city. And I heard God say to the other man, follow him, through the city and kill. Spare no one. Have mercy on no one. Kill the old men, young men, young women, mothers and children, but don't touch anyone who has the mark on his forehead. Start here at my temple. So they begin with the leaders who are standing there in the temple. This is why it's based on that verse that we believe that persecution will begin with the faithful Christians. And here's Ellen White's comments, which I really don't have time to read right now. Um, just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it's not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that they cannot be moved. That's the mark that will, that will identify them at the end. Well, um, we've been through everything. You've heard the story. Make your choices. Our kind and loving Father, you've challenged us to prepare ourselves for difficult times that are coming. And we believe your word. We believe that those times are coming. And we see in the world around us harbingers of things to come that really seem to be really bad. Whole nations fighting over religious issues. And we know that it's going to get worse. Forgive us where we have failed you and help us to be among those who will stand faithful and be able to look up one day and see you coming in the clouds is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.